blessing it is for me to be here after having a five-week hiatus from recording. I was away in Malaysia for two weeks. One of my close friends getting married over there and then coming back from my trip, sick. I was sick for a solid two, two and a half weeks. And it was the second time I was sick over the last year pretty intensely. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in certain relevant parts of this episode. But this this episode is going to be a very special one for me to get to facilitate. And I'm going to be talking about the only true form of freedom. It's funny because the last episode I did that was a solo episode was all about financial freedom. And I, I spoke about technical ways that you can get financially free. And I really don't want to discredit the importance of, of having your finances together because we need to put food on the table. And I think there's some beautiful wisdom in that. However, I just want to start uh, this episode by saying that what I'm going to cover in this particular podcast is going to be so much more important than what I covered in the financial freedom episode. And I know it can be alluring and exciting, the idea of making a bunch of money, and, and I totally get excited about the that game and that pursuit myself. But the the richness, the true richness that's going to come off what I share in this episode will just reverberate in the depth of your being as it does for me and as it does for, for, for everyone. So we're going to be talking about some really deep spiritual wisdom in this episode. And I'm excited that I get to talk about this because it's come off the back end of some reminders for myself, part of what getting sick taught me and reminded me of. And I can't wait to share it with you. So before we jump into the episode, just a reminder that I do this episode I'm talking to a computer right now. It's fulfilling for me because I know it's going out there and being of service. And I love being of service using my voice. And I'm getting to do that right now. My favorite way to be of service is to do it in person with beings that I can see and reflect off and connect with. And so getting to connect with you is meaningful for me. And if we haven't actually made connection yet outside this podcast, please send me a message on Instagram or send me an email. My email is ryan at ryanmagic.com. My Instagram handle is the Ryan Magic. Please shoot me a message and just reach out. It's always so fulfilling for me to hear from you guys. So that would be beautiful. If you want to take the next step and work with me further, my whole life's work has been put into a three-day in-person workshop called The Art of Courage. You can find out more information about that at ryanmagic.com. So let's get into the episode for today. So I, I took a little bit of time and sat with myself and didn't just record. I actually had another planned episode, which I'll, I'll, I might do as the next solo episode that I record. Uh, the, the, where I was planning on talking about the difference or the, the kind of wrestle between contentment and loving where you are and, and finding motivation. It's like such a contradiction. And this was something that was really alive for me maybe four weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I was going to do a solo episode, but then, then I got sick, as I, as I mentioned. But instead of just jumping into that episode today, I, I really took the time to reflect on what felt like the most meaningful thing to put out there and, and landed on the topic that I'm going to share today. And so there are so many different aspects to what I'm going to share, and I'll go off on little tangents to connect the dots together in, in the episode. Uh, but in a nutshell, I, I promise you that it will be enriching. If you can just really be as present as, as possible with what comes through, and I promise the dots will connect. So, the 
The concept I'm going to talk about in this episode, I perceive to be the biggest blind spot on the entire planet. Something that is so simple and such, so widely unseen. And it's just like the most wild thing in the planet. And when I remind you, you're going to be like, how could I forget this? If you've been, like, if it's a remembering for you, if it's an introduction to the concepts that I'm going to share today, then, you know, for me at least, it, it, it's blown my mind. And, and the concepts that I'm going to share today, I was introduced to six, six and a half years ago. And between that point and today, I've gone between remembering, forgetting, remembering, forgetting, <laughs> remembering, forgetting. When I forget, I find myself in this automated feeling of suffering. When I remember, I find myself so deeply connected that I have this enriching, beautiful relationship to life. And then I forget again and I just come back to awareness and, and think, how could I ever have forgotten this? How could I ever have forgotten something that is so real and true and meaningful and important? And so that's what I'm, I'm going to be talking about today, a real opportunity to remember. So just to, to start sharing and teaching some, some pieces. Firstly, I'm just going to, I'm going to pre-frame and you may have heard me talk about this before. It really is the foundation behind the wisdom that I share at this point in my life. It's the idea that as a human being, we have two aspects to our consciousness. So you have the aspect of your consciousness, a lens through which you view life that I call the head. You can be in your head. And the other side is you can be in your heart. And you can view life through that aspect of your consciousness. This is how I kind of summarize and consolidate the whole personal and spiritual development lens. That's how I integrate lots of different wisdom from different thought leaders. Instead of feeling like I'm learning something new, I can kind of see how all the different thought leaders refer to this uh, in different labels, but essentially they're pointing to the same things. So the head is the aspect of our consciousness that its primary motive is survival. And so this aspect of our consciousness is motivated by fear. And it's, a, a, it's an, essentially attempting to keep us alive. It really is what Joe Dispenza will call, which is called the animal in us. And the part of our brain, the amygdala, which is the fear center of our brain, it's like the oldest aspect of our brain that has like we've evolved and developed other layers of our brain over a, a long, like many, many uh, generations, thousands, tens of thousands of years. And but this this primitive aspect of our brain, the amygdala, really drives us in life to be motivated by survival. Okay, and so there's there's lots of different ways that people refer to this. It's also known as like the ego. It's also known as living below the line by, by Carl Jung. Uh, and I'm not going to get, I'm not going to mention too many of these things, but it's, it's essentially living in fear. We have the other aspect of our consciousness though, which is our heart. I call it the heart. Some people call it their higher self. Some people call it totality. Some people call it, um, living above the line. Some people call it God consciousness, uh, awareness. It's got lots of different titles. But essentially, this aspect of our consciousness has a very different motivation to the head. The heart's main goal is for us to grow or, or expand and for us to experience life. This is why I feel like we come to this human experience to grow, change, to evolve, and also just to have a really unique experience. Okay, we're all different people. We look different. We have hugely different life experiences. And I feel like uh, if we are all infinite, unmanifest potential and we all come from source consciousness, 
what's the point of of being oneness uh, by itself? we expand out from nothingness into something. We come into this manifest form because God wants to experience itself in all these different ways. Okay. I'm, I'm aware that I'm dropping some, uh, I'm talking in spiritual language and I'm sharing slightly more advanced concepts. You very well could know exactly what I'm talking about, but you may not either way. I'm going to continue to, to deepen on this, this concept. So, one of my amazing mentors, that um, a man that taught me to become a meditation teacher, who is Johnny Pollard, also the founder of One Giant Mind, which is a meditation app that's had millions of users and downloads. And he also teaches people to be meditation teachers. And he's also an author of a, a really brilliant book called The Golden Sequence. So Johnny Pollard has this interesting perspective, fits directly into what I'm saying, where he says the most powerful force on the entire planet is ignorance. You know, if, if someone said, said that to me before he said this, what's the most powerful force in the universe? I would say maybe love or truth or authenticity or imagination, but I wouldn't think ignorance. But this essentially the theory is that in order for us to forget as a human being, when we're stuck in that human consciousness, we have forgotten the fact that we are God in manifest human form. We've forgotten the truth of what we are. And for a force to cast a spell so strong to have us forget the fact that we are established in being and we come from source consciousness, the quantum world, the subatomic world, <laughs> for us to forget the fact that we are God is crazy. Imagine a, a spell that's so strong that it, it can be cast on God for him to forget or her to forget that they're God because that's what we are, right? Ram Das has that. Quote, we're all just God in drag. And what he's saying is that God manifests as all these different unique parts of infinite potential squirrels, rocks, trees, dogs, humans, lots of different flavors of all these things. Because the universe wants to know what it's like to experience itself in different ways. Because the universe is everything and it, it, manifests from that unseen, un, like non-phenomenal space that is unmanifest, stored potential, like what Joe Dispenza talks about. You can collapse time and space by going into the quantum realm, and it's just like an electron that can't be viewed, uh, doesn't exist until it's viewed. So as soon as you view an electron, it's there. Like... We are stored infinite potential that has manifested, right? But where did we come from? Con conception of an idea. So, again, I'm going to keep going deeper into the riddle here of the makings, the theorized makings of the universe, which I believe it's, and feel at such a deep level to be true. But the most powerful force in the universe is ignorance. And the reason I'm pre-framing this and, and mentioning this is because this episode is about finding freedom. Freedom is found in our heart consciousness, but the heart consciousness is so dependent on being able to be aware that we're in head consciousness to transcend that experience and that lens and that aspect of our consciousness to then re-immerse ourselves with the truth of what we are. And so, most spiritual gurus around the world, most Ajashanti, Sad Guru, Muji, Eckhart Tolle, Tara Brach, we have these amazing thought leaders around the world, spiritual gurus that point us towards the truth of what we are, towards this divinity, towards our heart, towards presence, being, oneness awareness, 
our higher self, the divine totality, non-duality. There's all these different ways it's referred to by different uh, teachers, different gurus. In an essence, they all echo the idea that suffering is found in the ego. And what they're saying there essentially is that when we're in the aspect of ourselves that has forgotten the truth of what we are, when we're in our ego, we're in that aspect of our consciousness that is driven by fear and survival, we're in stress. The aspect of our brain that powers this aspect of our consciousness, the, the head consciousness, the fear consciousness, is our amygdala. And our amygdala is our survival brain. It's the most primitive part of our brain that's literally driven to keep us alive. It's the trigger for the whole nervous system to go into the sympathetic uh, activation, fight or flight, and release stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. And that causes us to be in this state where we're so tunnel vision on our perception of threat that the last thing that we like, we're so in identity, in our ego, in our fear consciousness, in our amygdala, that we've completely forgotten the truth of what we are. We've, we've, we've left the awareness behind. So enter problem slash opportunity because everything's perfect. I was pretty much in my head for most of my life from a very young age, a lot of people say children are so connected to innocence, to totality, to spirit, to awareness, to the divine, so naturally. But because I grew up in such a stressful environment where I was in fight or flight and freeze and appease and fawn so, so at such an early age, you know, quite a loud, scary, abusive environment. Because of that, I, I've pretty much been in survival brain for most of my life, been suffering for most of my life, yeah. been in my ego for most of my life. And it wasn't until six and a half years ago that I actually had an awakening, so to speak, had enough awareness over the pain of my predicament, had, had awareness come in for me to recognize it, the fact that I was stuck in my head that I was able to see that truth. And so just taking stock of the ground we've covered so far in this episode, freedom, the only true form of freedom is when we actually have awareness over our conscious, con I'm burping, consciousness, awareness over our life because while we don't have awareness we are just completely reactive and driven by fear and what i i call this head hypnosis because i again divide our brain into these two aspects head consciousness heart consciousness could be fear consciousness and fulfillment or freedom consciousness so because we all have these two things, freedom exists when we have awareness and we can actually choose how we want to live with our lives, have presence when we want, what, like in our life, in our experience of life. But when we are taken by head hypnosis, like I refer to it, we're taken by head hypnosis, we go into this hypnotic state where our head is ruling our life, it's calling the shots. We're run off reactive subconscious programming. We have our head controlling our decision making to keep us comfortable, to keep us safe. We are sedated with addictive tendencies. And we're in a, usually in some form, even if it's subtle, of stress response. And we're essentially being controlled by that most powerful force in the entire universe, as Johnny Pollard refers to it as, ignorance. We're stuck in ignorance. We're ignorant. We have forgotten. We are sedated. Tara Brack, the amazing 
uh, kind of Buddhist led spiritual guru, an older an, an, an older woman now that's been doing this work for so many decades, that was the author of Radical Kindness, Radical Compassion, just an amazing uh, radical acceptance and radical compassion, amazing thought leader uh, and a and leader and, and guru. And she took, she calls this trance. You enter a trance like state. Uh, Napoleon Hill in uh, Outwitting the Devil, the book, he calls this drifting. When we forget, so you can call it ignorance, you could call it being reactive, you could call it drifting, ignorance, forgetting. Uh, again, I call it head hypnosis. Eckhart Tolle also calls it hypnosis. So the reason I'm reeling off these different leaders is because I, I've, I want you to know that this is not just me making up theory. This is like recognized. Even Carl Jung, who's like one of the godfathers of modern psychology, uh, a, a student of Sigmund Freud, even Carl Jung calls this living below the line. It's like when we're forgotten, when, when we're in that uh, animal. Again, Joe Dispenza calls this the animal, okay? So we're reactive in this state. And this is what all of these gurus cause, uh, say causes suffering when we're in this state. But we are literally programmed to, to have this part of our, it's, a, it's like one of the three areas of the brain. Yeah, it's, it's the most, the oldest aspect of our brain. It's the amygdala, but we've, we've evolved to develop our cortex. And in our prefrontal cortex, that's where higher, more, <laughs> I'm going to say the, the thing that differentiates the human race versus other animal species is this aspect of our brain, which is the most modern aspect of our brain, the most evolved aspect of our brain, it gives us the ability to connect to things like intuition and imagination and to have conscious thought. And it's, it's, it's the being aspect in human being. It's that heart aspect in the head heart aspects of our consciousness that I refer to. And so, just to, again, come back to the whole point of this podcast is that it doesn't matter how much work you've done on yourself. If you are triggered and you're in fear consciousness, you are going to be suffering. And we don't outgrow or out-evolve our ego because it's tied in and chained <laughs> to the very, it's in our brain. And so there are a lot of thought leaders and gurus that say that they've healed their trauma and they, they've had an ego death and that, and that part's gone. That's just simply not true. Even Eckhart Tolle still has an amygdala. So if he gets triggered, if someone just punches him in the face or he gets into a life, uh, like a near death, experience, his amygdala is going to fire off. He's going to forget the truth of what he is. He's no longer enlightened in that moment. He's connected to his amygdala. He's in his fear consciousness. He's in his survival brain, and he's going to be suffering. And so it doesn't matter how far along the journey of your spiritual evolution you go down, you've still got your head and you've still got your heart. And that really is one of the, one of the key messages I wanted to give in this episode it's just a reminder that all of us have a head and heart and neither of them are going anywhere. Even if you become really reactive and you're in a real challenging period of your life where you're binge eating and sedating and doing all these things that keep you reactive and stressed and you're just going through a real challenging time, your heart's still there patiently sitting there uh, time, as, as timeless 
love, timeless awareness. It doesn't go anywhere. And when we connect to spirit or we're, we're aware, let's say you have a beautiful meditation and you, you become, you remember, you're like, wow, I'm connected to spirit in this moment. You have that conscious awareness reinstated. Well, the head's still there. You're not enlightened. You're going to, you're going to oscillate between these two aspects of your mind, the head and the heart. And so true freedom is when you have the capacity to choose the steps you take with your life. True freedom is only obtainable from a place of awareness. And the reason being, when we're in fear consciousness, even if we perceive that we're calling the shots, it is not free will in those moments calling the shots. Okay? If you're in fear consciousness, you're essentially, if, and you're not aware, because you can be in fear consciousness and triggered with a little bit of background awareness that with that awareness allows you to choose a step that can help support regulation of the nervous system and a reconnection or a deeper connection and opening back to being in your heart, back to being in freedom, back to being in your in a fulfilled state. But if you are triggered and you're in fear consciousness and you don't have that background awareness in that moment, then you're in head hypnosis again. You have gone back into trance. And the now what I'm going to talk about, because this will really illuminate to you and, and give you more of a visceral understanding of, of what it looks like or how it functions when we are in head hypnosis, trance, when we have drifted, when we've gone into, uh, again, what I sometimes call the hypnotic prison of the mind. When we get into that state and fear consciousness, which Johnny Pollard calls ignorance, and he says it's the most powerful force in the entire universe. And I'm just going to jump in for and, and reiterate how powerful this is with one more fun fact, which you may or may not have heard me talk about before, but our nervous system houses clusters of, of nerves in this strip of flesh that goes along our spinal column, and that flesh is called ganglia. And in this strip of flesh, it's where the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system houses clusters of, clusters of nerves which impact the perceptivity of perceived danger and the regulation or the, the, the information that it sends out the activation of either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. So essentially, we have this, uh, we, we have 2.5 times more sympathetic clusters of nerves in our body than we are, than we have parasympathetic. So if you look at the ganglia and you look at like a anatomy diagram and you look at the clusters of nerves for each of the different nervous systems, there are two and a half times more clusters of nerves for the sympathetic than the parasympathetic. In other words, there is 2.5 times more power and influence that the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, the fear consciousness aspects of the nervous system has over you than the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest, going into homeostasis or to regulation, to connect with your heart, to be in awareness, to be in your heart, to be in fulfillment, to be in freedom. And so to summarize what I just said, if you have two aspects of your consciousness, head and heart, then from a nervous system influence, which is the part that activates either stress hormones or love hormones, like the, the influence is two and a half times more powerful from the stress side of things. In other words, if when you're going through your life, your head and your heart are fighting off, I want you to imagine a 250 kilo muscular man representing the fear consciousness 
250 kilos versus 100 kilos. Or another way we could say that is 40 kilos versus 100 kilos. So imagine a 100 kilo fully massive jacked man, and that is the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, the fear consciousness that pumps adrenaline and cortisol. And that one is fo- when the, when the, oof, this is why it's difficult to stay regulated. This is why Johnny Pollard says ignorance is the most powerful force in the entire universe because from a aspect of our consciousness, the human aspect, the fear consciousness is literally two and a half times more powerful than the other one. So, of course, when they fight, usually the head hypnosis wins, the head wins, fear wins. It's so difficult to get your fulfillment to win because it's so much less influential from a nervous system perspective. And if you've got adrenaline and cortisol saying, danger, danger, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die, and the survival brain kicks in, that's going to be pretty overwhelming. And so, if you imagine it's in a fight in the moment where like which consciousness is going to dominate your awareness in the moment, is it going to be your head or your heart? And you've got a 40 kilo man that's like mus- muscular for their size and a hundred kilo man. There's just, it's very, very difficult for the 40 kilo man to win. It's one way to look at it. It's not exactly how it works. But just another way to to understand how powerful this ignorance is, how powerful our ego is, how powerful fear consciousness is, how powerful our paras- our sympathetic nervous system is. You know, it, it really has a lot of influence over us, which is why most people, most of the time on the planet, are in head hypnosis, which means that they're being run by fear. And they have no idea that they're run by fear. This is like the biggest blind spot in the entire planet. It's the biggest blind spot in the entire planet. And so when someone is in fear consciousness, they are being run and and they are being run by the, the strong desire and need to be in the familiar familiar behavioral patterns, familiar safety strategies. Um, So essentially, I I see head hypnosis as having like three main strategies that it uses to control its influence over us and our our lived human experience. So me as Ryan, my head hypnosis uses these three things to keep me in control so I don't go into my heart and don't venture out into the unknown and don't go out there attempting to be free thinking. Because if I transcend and I connect to my heart and I remember the truth of what I am, then what happens to my head? What happens to my ego? Well, it dissolves in significance. And when it's when when I'm becoming aware and I'm transcend, that's why people find it so hard to meditate because meditation connects you back to awareness. And if you're in the process of connecting back to awareness, your ego will put up an enormous fight, which is why it can be so agitating and so much resistance can come to meditation because you're teaching yourself to orient your life based on your heart and not your head. So your head will do whatever it has to because it thinks it's trying to help you. It's not a bad thing. But it does lead to suffering because it is literally fear-based and it causes stress. So when we're in our head, the way that head hypnosis will control us is three main, it's like a, there's lots of different ways, but the main three are as follows. I'm just trying to remember the acronym that I use for it. It's, I can't remember the acronym, but I know the three. So there's addiction is the first one. And this is like one of the biggest ones. So any addictive tendencies that sedate us is a really big strategy of head hypnosis. So scrolling is an example. Social media, phone usage, 
your head loves this because when you're in it, you're not aware. You're completely, you're like a zombie. Okay. You've gotten out of awareness and you've gone so far into the control of the mind's web of head hypnosis into trance. You're in trance. If you're scrolling, you're in trance, right? You've, you're not remembering the truth of what you are. You're in trance. And so you're reactive. When you're in trance, you don't even realize, scroll, 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 scroll. There's this desperate, reactive, uh, adrenaline-fueled escapade that all of a sudden now you're getting up from scrolling and you go to the fridge and you're looking for processed foods, which is another form of like sedation technique or another addictive tendency. Yeah. Emotionally eating, eating sugar or stimulants like coffee. There's all these addictions that we have that keep us sedated. It's a control mechanism of our head hypnosis. So I will give some more examples in a sec, but just to take stock of where we are in this episode, you follow this podcast because you want to learn to grow. You, you want to make your life better. And I'm here now just bestowing a, like a really important reminder to you. I'm giving you some awareness right now of what true freedom is. Because as humans, with an amygdala that's powering us and a nervous system that's two and a half times, the sympathetic nervous system, two and a half times more influential than our heart, right? With the most powerful force in the entire universe, according to Johnny Pollard, ignorance, we, we fall into trance so easily. When we fall into trance, which is just so easy to do in this modern society, we, we lose connection to like the freedom in life, to our actual awareness, to the power that we have, the power of our heart. Yeah, we lose that connection. We're just in this mindless robotic. We're in the matrix, right? We're in the matrix and we're just living like robots, scrolling away, eating sugar, looking for the next hit. So, Addiction is, is like one of the big forms. I'm, I'm reminding you right now of the trap of our powerful egos, how it controls us to stop us evolving, to stop us growing, because it doesn't want to go into that unfamiliar, as Joe Dispenza would say. The, the, the animal wants to stay alive and it's going to do whatever it can to control us to stay in the familiar and not go outside and crash into the walls too much. Just commit keep that familiar past repeating on autopilot okay it doesn't want us to liberate it doesn't want us to move into freedom because it's scared that's why it's the fear consciousness our head is fear consciousness but while we're in that mode while we're in that trance we're stuck we're stuck in hypnosis we're stuck sedated like a heroin addict I know it sounds dramatic, but it's true. It's so all-consuming and powerful. How do I know? Because I get stuck in it all the time. And I spend a lot of time prioritizing practices and lifestyle choices that keep me connected to awareness. And still, I forget so regularly, right? So, that's one form that head hypnosis uses, addiction. Uses addiction. And you might think, I'm not really an addict. Well, do you, what's, your, what's your screen time on, the, on your social media, on, on your phone? What's your screen time? If it's more than like 30, 45 minutes, you are an addict. Yeah, do we really need that? Is that what we want in our hearts? Is that, is that if we could really choose where we're going? Apparently, the average uh, Westerner spends, the average Westerner spends around five hours a day on our phone which is 15 years of our life. If you're 30 years old and you live to 80, then you're going to spend 15 years of your life on your phone. If you're really connected to your higher self, connected to your heart, is that how you'd want to spend your life? You're shot in this consciousness, in this body as you. Do you really want to spend 15 years on your phone? It's wild. No, of course you don't. But it's not your fault. It's that we have an ego. We have fear consciousness. Everyone does. This is the biggest blind spot in the entire planet. I'm just reminding you. 
Okay, so one tactic that head hypnosis uses to control you out of liberation because it's trying to keep you safe is addiction. So scrolling, coffee, sugar, takeout, emotional eating, TV, Netflix. Uh, it can be any addiction. It doesn't have to be these common ones. It could be smoking. It could be drinking. But it can also be things like working, like overworking and busyness. It could be cleaning. Anything that's compulsive, anything that if I removed from your life would cause anxiety, that's attachment. That's something that you need. Okay. So addiction is a big way that we are trapped and not free. This is the only true freedom. Because if you're making lots of money, reactive from head hypnosis and you're not even aware you're not even choosing it i run a business and built a big business in head hypnosis i don't i I watch videos of myself back in the day and i didn't even choose what i was doing i was on autopilot i was i was a robot i was my subconscious programming and insecurities that were driving me from a place of fear trying to prove myself trying to be enough trying to be so good that I'll finally be loved. But I wasn't even aware of it. I was in complete ignorance. I was victim of the most powerful force in the universe. I was stuck in a deep hypnosis, in a trance. Yeah, and I had the money, but I was suffering the whole time. I had migraines. I I had adrenal fatigue. I was burning relationships. I was traveling to amazing places around the world, and I wasn't even able to be present. I was just planning the next thing. So it's not about what we're doing. It's about the state in which we embrace it. When we're connected to awareness, when we're connected to our heart, we're able to be present and enjoy and soak up the beauty of it. When we're stuck in our head, we're not even getting to enjoy the experience. We're not even fully there for it. Yeah, not even fully there for it. So anyway, going back to head hypnosis, Addiction is one form, all right? Another form is protective strategies, personality patterning, right? You could go into uh, being a pleaser to try to stay safe. That's a familiar pattern. You could go into busyness. You could go into your achievement pattern. You could go into being a gossip. You could go into like feeling different and separate from everyone else as like an artist kind of thing. There's light and shadow qualities to all archetypes and all patterns, right? However, they still are utilized by the head as a way to use the past and in the subconscious conditioning and programming that we have to replay on autopilot a part of ourselves from a place of fear to create what Tony Robbins would say, an emotional home, to relive the past. It's familiar and therefore it feels safe. So when we're younger, we form our personality based on what our parents kind of sculpt us into by them saying, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. This is good. Well done. Do more of that. And we learn how we should show up. Okay. So we've got a bunch of rules in our mind of who we should be. It's, it's called our uh, safety script. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, safety. A uh, survival script. Survival script. Uh, we, we, we write a script unconsciously in our mind of who we need to be to be loved by our parents, and we just keep playing that strategy. That's what I was doing with my business, achieving, achieving, achieving. It wasn't me consciously choosing what was going to create most fulfillment for me, what was going to be most liberating for me. It was me reactively being the person that my parents needed I perceive my parents needed me to be for me to be lovable. So that's another strategy that head hypnosis uses. It's just going to go, cool, insert uh, insert algorithm achiever, boom, go. And then it starts playing off these familiar patterns. I'm in, hip- I'm in hypnosis. I'm just playing out the achiever. Another one that I do is the manipulator. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even realize I'm in it. But to try to stay safe in my relationship, I go into this manipulating, judgmental version of myself 
that's merit and learnt or kind of inherited from my dad and the way that he treated myself and my family growing up. And I don't even realize that I'm playing out this strategy in my beautiful relationship with my beautiful partner. I'm all of a sudden manipulating and controlling because I'm in head hypnosis. I'm definitely not aware. I'm disconnected from my heart and I'm fully in my head because I'm having survival activated and I'm being triggered and scared of intimacy, scared of commitment, scared of connection. And boom, head hypnosis comes in and go controlling, press play on manipulator, press play on the judge. And all of a sudden I start firing off these safety strategies. Okay. And we all have these different ones. It could be the joker. And you start playing out that quick. It's getting uncomfortable in this connection. Joker, start deflecting. Okay. Or it could be angry. You know, everything else is not working. Get angry. Well, why would you say that? What would you do? And it just creates distance, safety coming back in. The head hypnosis is in control. It's controlling us with these pre programmed, like just pre- pressing play on the programs. So the head uses addiction. It uses protection strategies or patterning. Okay. Uh, and it uses uh, stories. It uses stories. That's the other one. Okay, cool. So now I remember the acronym SAP. First, it saps us. Okay, it saps us. It sedates us. It uh, breaks us down. It saps our energy. All right. That's what head hypnosis does. Stories are a big one. Okay, so S A P. Stories, addictions, patterning. Okay. So stories is just like the mind just tells us a story and we and we believe it. So this is the thing that's scary about head hypnosis in my perspective and why so many people kind of are going in there going about their life in complete trance, responding to conversations, choosing decisions of what they want to do for the day, taking actions, speaking to people, but they're not actually aware of what they're saying. They're just saying like how are you going? Good. What'd you get up to? I spent time with my family on Christmas Day. There's, there's not awareness of what's happening because they're sedated. They're in trance. All right. Now, stories are, are a huge strategy that the head uses to feed us, to have us stay in the familiar, to keep us in control. It'll just feed us random limiting beliefs and stories, and we will make decisions based off it. So, for example, because our heart wants to go into the unknown to grow and liberate and, and, and find fulfillment. Let's say, for example, you have a dream. Okay. You want to go out there and you want to start a business or put yourself out there in some way and share your heart with the world and be of service in some way. But instead of just doing it, you're just avoiding it. And one of the reasons you're avoiding it is because you're convinced because you've taken the bait of your head because it's telling you a story and it's just said, but we don't have our niche yet. That might be the story. Oh, we don't have our niche yet though. Or it could be, well, we're too young. We don't have enough experience. And without even questioning it, because our nervous systems are usually dysregulated, our minds are so influent, like easily influenced. And you could literally right now have not taken action on your dream business for six months because you instantly believe the story that your head fed you just saying that uh, that you don't know your niche. And so you're literally like, yeah, I just don't know my niche yet. I don't know exactly what I want to do. So instead of doing the next aligned step, which might be finding the niche, or it might be just announcing that you're going to start launching music out to the world and just instead of just putting it out there, which is what your heart would desire, the head just blocks it and just goes, nope, that ain't happening. We're going to just give him a story. Or it might just be like you're feeling kind of like anxious or nervous of stepping into the unknown and launching your business. Or your head hypnosis uses, let's just get him, go, get him to drink a beer. Get him to feel really hungry. Get him to get him on their phone. Scroll. So it's going to either use addictions, it's going to get you into your, uh, maybe it puts you in procrastination, which is a pat- pattern. Let's just get them to procrastinate. Yeah. Let's just get them to uh, stay busy and clean. 
so into addictions, into personality patterning or protection strategies, or just believe in stories. And these three things can completely determine your entire life decisioning, your actions, your behaviors, and the quality of your life, the meaning in your life. And so you're essentially asleep. This is why waking up is an idea or having an awakening because it's kind of like being asleep when you're just connected to your personality, just connected to your ego, and in head hypnosis, trance, the hypnotic prison of the mind, the animal, yeah? With that, when you're in ignorance, you are literally held captive by fear consciousness, literally held captive by fear consciousness. So this is the beautiful opportunity. So I'm going to tell a quick story. You're doing really well with this. I'm, I'm even getting a little bit tired because my mind's trying to stop me teaching all this stuff because it, it will free you with the awareness that will free you. But what happens for me is because I've associated a lot of pain to business, because I've uh, – Oh, I'm actually going to reverse that. I was sick recently. I've been sick for two solid bouts of sickness over the last 12 months. I haven't been sick a lot for the last five years. I'm physically the healthiest that I've ever been in my entire life. I have almost zero unhealthy food. I am really supportive of my body. I get amazing sleep from like a, I've, I've completely healed myself from uh, adrenal fatigue, and yeah, I have, I, I'm, I'm physically really healthy, but I've been sick twice in the last year. Not just little sickness, like a couple of weeks at a, in both cases, which is crazy. And the reason why is because what's happened is the universe has attempted to support me with this concept that I'm sharing with you guys, which is why I'm sharing it with you. Because what's happened in both times I've gotten sick is I've been picking up momentum in my business and my safety strategies, my patterning, my head hypnosis has kicked in with some patterning, gone play the, play the uh, achiever script. And I've kind of gotten into that zone of from a place of fear, how many people am I going to get to my Art of Courage workshop? How am I going to grow this thing a little bit faster? And I've started to put work, service, success above the quality of my experience. Being in the trigger zone of being in business and making progress and having the opportunity for significance and to feel good about myself conditionally by feeling like I'm doing a good job with my service and my business, which is nothing wrong with that. So the universe cares and loves about me so much that it will only allow me to be on the journey of service if I'm carrying a state of presence on that journey. And I'm doing it from my authentic heart desires, really connected to what's really going to light me up, who I really want to serve with, like doing this podcast episode. This is so meaningful for me to share this to you. Again, I could have just plugged and played some other podcast episode. I had another plan episode but no I, I really took the time to feel into it because i i brought awareness into this and that gives me the most fulfilling experience as the person that's running the episode because i'm talking about what feels most meaningful for me but it's also a message that's coming in from spirit because i'm doing this podcast episode with awareness however what happened was the first time i got sick it was the day before an Art of Courage workshop. And I had been excited about this workshop for like two months earlier. And I had all these people bought plane tickets, accommodation to come to Melbourne. I never cancelled a workshop or a retreat before in my entire life. And I've run 30, 40, 50 retreats. Never. And it comes to the, the morning, the day before, and I wake up horrendously sick so sick to the point that I could barely even sit up in bed. And I have to cancel my Out of Courage workshop. And for the first like hour, two hours, when I like woke up, I was like, 
distressed. I was so stressed out. I was like, what? I'm going to have to cancel this thing. And then I realized within like five hours, obviously, this because I trust that everything happens perfectly. Everything happens for a reason. And so I, I accepted it. And I, I knew that there was a reason that the universe had given me a sickness. I believe that every form of physical ailment, every injury, every bit of disease, every, every circumstance that we experience in life that feels unfavorable is all giving feedback to support us to course correct and live with more love, live more from our hearts. So I knew that there was something there, but I didn't know what it was. And I realized, so I, I, a couple of hours of like resisting, and then I ended up making the call. And then for three or four days, I was in so much pain. I was just distracting myself. I was sedating myself. I was in head hypnosis. And then I realized the universe has slowed me down because I was making progress with my business, but I wasn't carrying. I was still meditating every day. I was still doing certain things, but it was more to tick them off. I wasn't carrying awareness with me. And therefore, I was ticking the boxes. I was making progress, but I wasn't as fulfilled as I could be. And I wasn't carrying the embodiment of what I teach, which is the purpose of life is fulfillment. And I wasn't carrying full fulfillment with me. Not that I have to be perfect with it, but I really had forgotten and fallen into head hypnosis. And the universe knew that I was not going to slow down unless it forced me to slow down. And so it knocked me down. Then really got the transmission. It's important to slow down. Bring the connection to spirit, to oneness, to awareness, to my heart, to that freedom, the only true freedom where I've transcended that pow most powerful force in the universe, which is fear, ignorance, and reconnected with my heart to bring that with me on the journey. And that's why I got sick. Then, progress. I actually ended up running me out of courage a couple of months later or whenever it was, six weeks later. And it was one of the most beautiful, it was the most beautiful workshop I've ever run. And then more progress, momentum, picking up momentum with the heart's prayers, lots of people wanting to work with me, lots of opportunities, lots of people signed up for the next Art of Courage. And then I'm like doing lots of content, super excited to get stuck back into it when I got back from Malaysia three and a bit weeks ago. And then boom, sick, sick again. I was like, what? How could I be sick again? And I'd forgotten because I'd also fallen back into head hypnosis. Also fallen back into head hypnosis. So the universe was supporting me. I don't have to rush. I don't have to rush. The purpose of life is fulfillment. Fulfillment is found in our heart. Our heart is what creates the experience of presence when we're in that beautiful aspect of our consciousness and we're aligning and connecting our lives from that angle. We're experiencing the only true form of freedom. And so I got sick again because the universe was like, we are not going to let or you're, you're at a point in your evolutionary journey of awakening or whatever where you deserve it, and you need to embody this message. You need to stay connected to your heart. It's so important. And we're not going to let you progress and get all this big success and blah, 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 which is not even going to fulfill you. We're not going to give you that unless you carry presence on the journey and you remain detached from that and connected to what's truly important, which is presence which is presence. And that was such a gift for me. Such a gift. Such a gift. And that's where I am right now. My gosh, I had to fight the resistance and the urge because I had lots of people waiting to chat to me, wanting to work with me. And I had to resist the urge to just be like, cool, uh, you know, I'm sick, but let's just book in this chat. I had to resist that urge and go, no, this is recovery. I need to rest. Need to connect to spirit, even if it means that these people go away and you don't make the sales, you don't have these people coming to your workshop, 
You're not going to have as many people coming to your workshop. If you do the workshop from your head, you are not going to have as fulfilling of an experience as if you do it from your heart. So if you have 100 people, but you're not even present for it, what's the point? Versus having 10 people, but being present there with the people and actually getting to extract joy, love, presence, peace, having a beautiful experience, a meaningful, deep experience, because I'm present for the journey. Okay? (sighs) That's the gift here. That's the only true freedom that exists, being connected to your heart. And that is impossible, my friends, when we're in head hypnosis. And so the whole purpose of this episode is to make you aware of the fact that if you're like most other people, including myself, we are living in an environment that has ego traps everywhere. You've got social media everywhere. You've got a pace of life that is so much faster than what our nervous systems were designed for, where the nervous system is firing false alarms as a consistent steady state, saying you're in danger, you're in danger, where it's just because we are overworked. We need to work a certain amount to pay the bills, to even stay in a city and pay the bills and afford rent. We have social media everywhere, unhealthy processed food everywhere. We have all of our friends and family living in their heads, living in fear and sending that energy your way. It is just the baseline. And so just by existing in this modern society, you are going to be tripping into head traps, into sedation, addiction techniques. It's going to put you back in fear consciousness. Head hypnosis is going to take over again. And you're going to be in your personality patterns, living reactively, living out of fear, avoiding taking the meaningful action you want to, to be of service in the world and actualize your dreams and prioritize what's important to you. Yeah. You're going to be telling all these stories and essentially suffering. And it's part of life. I do it. In fact, the universe intentionally triggers us so that we can find the aspects of us that are still false beliefs of fear and we can alchemize them, be with them, feel the pain connected to them and find the aspects of us that where we were told that weren't lovable as kids and learned to love those parts so we can become more whole. So we get triggered less often. But the universe does expose us to triggers to support us to evolve, for sure. That's, that's not going anywhere. However, if you want to live freely, you're going to have to live very differently to the average person because society is normalized being in trance. Again, it's the world's biggest blind spot. It's the world's biggest blind spot. So your only true freedom is going to exist living a life that's very different to what it has looked like probably for most of your life and what it looks like for most people. You must make spaciousness a priority. You must, if you want to live with freedom, spaciousness must be a priority. That means taking time to connect with nature. That means learning and finding a way to decrease screen time. That means prioritizing a meditation practice, preferably a being technique to start, which is TM, Transcendental Meditation, or Vedic Meditation, or coming and learning from me with core meditation, or Johnny Pollard's modality, One Giant Mind, which you can just download his app for free and start practicing that. There's like some tutorials on how to do that practice, which are amazing. Just do that for free. You can start prioritizing a being technique. Or you can do something like 
Muji's Invitation to Freedom, which is on Spotify. It's a free guided meditation. Or you can do more of a witnessing observation technique where you just sit there in stillness and you observe your breath. Yeah, really powerful. Or you can do Vipassana, which is some different unique Buddhist flavors of the same thing. You're in self-observation, learning to redirect your mind. Okay. And just gain some influence over the reactivity so you, become, you, you maintain awareness. Stay connected to your heart. But like I said earlier, if head hypnosis and ignorance is the most powerful force in the entire universe, then in order to live free, it's going to take a devotion. And it's something that I'm committed to and realize because the universe won't let me live without awareness. And so I slip out of awareness every single day, a bunch of times every single day. However, I, I, I personally have to prioritize minimum 30 to 40 mi- minimum. I'm going to say 40 minutes twice a day of meditation for me. For me, one of my big head traps or the way that my mind controls me with addiction is the phone. So I literally, see if I, yeah, I've got it in this room. You may not see what I'm holding up, but I'm essentially holding up my phone, which is in like a stat block bag. And uh, it says, will this fulfill you? And then under an hour, because my just strong standard is to have my screen time under an hour a day. This is a recent initiative that I've struggled so much to manage my screen time. I'm just getting my phone out right now and I'm going to show you guys, see where my screen time's at for the day. So my daily average is an hour and 15 minutes. Whoa. Um, Let's see what the actual activity is. Today it's been 50 minutes. Okay. And that's, I sent like 30 or 40 minute of voice messages to my one-to-one clients. And I put it back in this bag and I use it as little as possible. But my screen time before that was like, and I tried so many different things. I've got no notifications. I've got on all my social media apps, I've got timers, so screen time blockers. So message comes up after 10 minutes or 15 minutes of Instagram or whatever and just kicks me off. And I still end up on my phone for hours a day because I use my phone for things like maps. I use my phone for things like my timer. So these things promote the kind of like, I don't know if this works exactly the same for you. I'm assuming it does. I'm pretty sure it will. But if I have like uh, a processed sugar ice cream like or a brownie that's synthetic, like processed sugar brownie, unhealthy brownie, and I have that, or even if it's a healthy brownie and it's got a bunch of sugar in it, I have that. And then my mind, my head hypnosis is logging that as an option for sedation. Okay. So in the back of my mind, in my periphery, my mind is looking now and going, huh, that's a good idea for a control mechanism. And then next day I'm driving past and my head hypnosis, so sneaky, is just being like, hey, you should stop at that healthy thing and just get in the sidewall. And then, it, oh, that's a good idea. And then I'm back in head hypnosis, having the acai bowl, and then the day after an acai bowl. And my mind is using the sugar as a sedation technique, right? But if I have no sugar, it kind of drifts away as an option from my head hypnosis. It tries to use other strategies, okay? So with my phone, it's similar. If I've got maps open, my phone, I'm, I'm, my mind is consuming. My head hypnosis is like, yes, the phone's an option. We're on, even though I'm on maps, using maps in my car, driving somewhere, it's, it's, it's still like having a brownie, even though it's just maps. It's like having a brownie and the sugar's in my system and my mind is then like backlogged that, not forgotten, and is very quick to suggest other ways that I could get sugar the next morning or the next afternoon or what are we having for dessert tonight? Same thing with my phone. So I don't use my phone for maps or I have a really quick look 
at the maps and then I just remember my way and I put my phone back in the bag. Because if not, I'm going to be on it checking messages. All of a sudden, I'm in a scroll hole because it's so addictive. And my head is head hypnosis. The ignorance is the most powerful force in the entire universe. I do not have control over it. So I have to be proactive. I have to minimize my screen time. I have to really work on it, put these things in place. Today, 50 minutes on the phone. I've been present. I've done two 40-minute meditations. I've grounded and been in nature. I've prepared healthy food. I've done some journaling, some healthy practices. It's been quite a fulfilling day. There has not been much stress today. Right? I've, I've had a really wholesome, beautiful day. Now, if I was on my phone early in the day, I also have things in place like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a whole episode on managing my phone. You know what? But yeah, just to, to, to bring this episode home, it takes conscious effort to manage and direct your experience in life to be more wholesomely fulfilling by living presently in the heart, it takes concerted effort. It really does. If not, you're just going to give your, it's going to make it easier and easier for your body to sedate you, for head hypnosis to control you. You're like, screw it, I'll just have a bunch of ice cream. Cool. Now your nervous system has got less energy, so you're going to be even more depleted which is going to make it harder to make a conscious decision next. So this episode, your freedom exists with awareness. The most beautiful gift, it can be, take so much resistance to prioritize a meditation practice, so much resistance. But when it becomes a non-negotiable, you can find the freedom you've been looking for your entire life that your soul and your heart are patiently waiting for to be seen and recognized, not because they need to feel inflated by that, because they want you to be free. There's pa- your heart's patiently waiting there as an omnipresent energy of unconditional timeless love. It's not in a rush for you to get there, but you as a human being transcend and awaken by being able to shed the layers of conditioning that keep you stuck in your humanity. And you can live freely as a human being by prioritizing being. And from that place, grow from that place, do business. From that place, connect with your family. From that place, choose what you're going to eat. From that place, soak up the magic of your weekend adventure. Or from from that place, enjoy a beautiful walk in nature. It's not about, hey, you should meditate all the time, but just by the sheer exposure that we have as modern participants of society in the Western world, we need, we, we need to prioritize awareness activities or head hypnosis is going to have a field day with you, a absolute field day with you yeah even when you prioritize awareness practices like meditation it's still going to be very influential but if you don't you ain't standing a chance against it it is just gonna run your show and you might you're gonna have ups and downs in that you might be like oh it's going really well i've just got this promotion but you're going to feel more and more separate as days go by and you're going to step into suffering. It is inevitable. It's not me being mean or pessimistic. It's the truth of our human experience. That the purpose of coming here was to forget that we were God so that we can find our way back to that reality. We can find our way back to that truth and liberate through that. And that's when you get a really beautiful chapter of life. It's not that the, uh, there's not beauty in pain. It's not that there's not beauty in challenge. Because you're still going to have challenge as you're awakening. But to experience life through the lens of awareness is the ultimate gift. It's the ultimate gift. 
so beautiful. Such a miracle. <laughs> to, to, uh, we are so lucky to have the awareness I'm sharing with you now. I am so lucky to have this awareness given to me by other amazing pointers, gurus, leaders. Thank you so much. And I resist my practice like crazy. I have some serious karma in my life. I've spoken about it openly on this podcast. I spent three days at my beautiful partner's holiday house with her parents. Being down there just in family for me is terrifying. So easily triggered. And then I'm triggered and my head hypnosis pounces on the opportunity. Eat this, do this, get on your phone. But instead, to be able to maintain awareness, what did I do? I chose to meditate. Not perfectly, I resisted it, but I chose to feel the pain, be with it. Because I want to live freely. I want to live connected to my heart. And it takes consistent, relentless devotion dedication, commitment, and discipline to be able to find that freedom because you are working against the most powerful force in the universe. So wake up. Wake up from your somber. You needed to be there because it's part of the human experience to forget that I'm giving you the opportunity to remember, to prioritize the sacred opportunity of awakening as a human being to your being. You deserve it. You deserve it. But no other proposal of freedom is going to give anything close to the only true form of freedom, which is being connected to awareness. Because every decision that's made from the ego is one that's made unconsciously. So you're not even choosing. Your past is choosing. You're just manifesting the familiar past, as Joe Dispenza would say. You can only really be free and actually have conscious choice when you're aware of your experience. If not, you are in a hypnotic prison without any idea that that's the reality. That is not freedom. That is not freedom. So, inviting you to do the, whatever the next layer of devotion looks like for you. Whatever the next, because it takes so much courage. What's the next courageous choice for you to shift your lifestyle to be even more devoted to awareness? So what does that look like for you? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to start to incorporate? It's going to take so much courage. It's going to take so much courage. Trust me, just the level of confidence that comes from being connected to spirit. It's so, 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 so special. So, I think we'll leave it there. Yeah, I think we'll leave it there. You're exactly where you're meant to be. And this is a reminder. Just a reminder. I'm just another dude on my own journey with the same thing. Reminding you, because I love you, because I love myself, that you deserve to be free. You deserve to be free. <laughs> <laughs> that's it that was a long one it's an hour and 20 minutes well i appreciate your presence and sticking around i love you again if you haven't reached out hit me up ryan at ryanmagic.com or the ryan magic on instagram they're my two preferred places and if you're ready to to, to figure out how waking up integrates with being in this planet if you're wanting to tie it all together 
and know where the emotional healing work fits into growing a business, which fits into financial freedom, which fits into purpose and service and connecting in relationships and mindset and spirituality. They're all very contradictory at times. How do they fit together? Well, I was battling that for many, many, many years and I had a clear, integrated and grounded perspective that I was gifted by God and it's as my mission on this planet to teach how it all works together. And that's what I teach at the Art of Courage workshop. The Art of Courage is not just, hey, how do you go crazy and do all this big stuff? The Art of Courage, courage comes from the Latin root word core, which means heart. That's where courage comes from. It comes from the word core, which means heart. And this whole episode, I spent talking about the purpose of life is fulfillment. Fulfillment and freedom are pretty much synonyms. And they come from living in the heart. And so I've got this really unique way. It will blow your mind in a positive way. Blow that mind. <laughs> And really shine light on the truth of how to navigate the complexities of all these different layers of life. We got mindset, we got healing, we got success, we got money. How do they fit together? Well, the art of courage, the art, because it's so it's so subtle and nuanced, and it takes discernment to be courageous to live in your heart. How does it all integrate together? Well, Come along to The Art of Courage and I'll share with you how. I'd love to have you there. You can find out more information at ryanmagic.com. That's the end of this episode. I love you guys so much and I'll see you in the next one.